1-4 is a bit of a unique level in Ultra Kill. In terms of the size of the levels, 1-4 is one of the smallest, if not the smallest, level in the game. It consists of a couple hallways, a couple of rooms, and the single biggest reality check for any new player of the game. This is V2. V2 is the boss of the Limbo layer, and it's not that easy to beat. This is mainly because V2 combines several things you really don't want ending up on the same boss. High speed, good damage, the ability to dodge, and a good amount of health on one of the smallest hitboxes in the game. One would think that clearing this thing as fast as possible would almost require some RNG of V2 walking into some of your shots. But speedrunners figured out a way to rend this entire level apart. And not only that, but they accidentally managed to make the most confusing progression ever seen before in Ultra Kill speedrunning. This is the history of the 1-4 world record progression. Our story starts on the day of Ultra Kill going into early access, the 3rd of September, 2020. Like with all games that feature an in-game timer, someone is going to try to speedrun it, and that's exactly what runner DK Pulls did. Tried his hand at speedrunning what was, at the time, probably the most difficult boss in the game. It starts with a series of free dash jumps, or FDJ, which at the time was considered one of the best approaches to movement. This is because in the demo, sliding speed was always capped at the base sliding speed, so a slam storage into slide jumps didn't do anything really. This changed with Ultra Kill's release into early access, and now chaining slide jumps increases movement speed up to a certain very high capped speed. In short, chaining FDJ used to be one of the few ways to maintain high speeds, but has since fallen out of practice due to it being unnecessary. DK does continue this until the checkpoint, where he then boosts himself forward by shooting a core eject straight down while sliding, launching him forward into the air. All the while, shooting out the window above the skull, skipping all the skulls collecting you would need to do otherwise. He then lands in the V2 fight. Here we see, even in the first day of Ultra Kill's release, a nail trap. DK places one magnet to start with, that way he can spew nails during V2's little intro sequence, and another behind it specifically so that the little ball of nails will now be directly in line to hit V2 the moment that V2 can be damaged. Once this little cutscene ends, this nail ball takes out half of V2's health. DK then uses a two-coin rail coin, almost killing V2. Unfortunately, he misses this next projectile boost, and it turns into a point-blank shotgun shot and a punch, which takes out the last bits of V2's health. Like other levels, the end door does not open until the last room is cleared, and for boss levels, this means killing said boss. 1-4 also has a small additional detail that you need to pick up the arm that V2 drops after killing him if you want the door to open. So in this run, we see DK wait for it to fall from the sky, as it only drops once V2 reaches the center of the arena and is able to jump away. DK then dashes over to the door to exit the level as fast as possible. This sets the first ever official time on this level, at 28.108. Looking back on this run, there are some clearly unoptimized portions, and was more of a day one run to set a baseline, setting the stage for future runs. Something that stands out is the fact that DK dashes after passing through the noun broken window, delaying V2's spawn sequence, and a second is lost on this alone. However, this run also immediately got some things right, such as the core eject boost through the painting, something accepted as a standard for a long time and is still in many people's runs today. Overall, this run, all things considered, is really good. This is a better time than some casual players will ever get on this level, and demonstrated a very clear understanding of the game mechanics, as well as some quick thinking to take down V2 as fast as possible. A few days later, on the 6th of September 2020, a runner named Potluck would come in with a new world record, improving pretty much everything about the run. The first change was not just slide jumping through the level. Pot opted to CE boost at the start of the level, giving him a large boost of speed immediately, and completely bypassed the troublesome stone arch. Pot then boosted again later through the window, just as DK did to land in the V2 fight, but did not lose much time to hesitation. Pot then shows he had further refined the strategy by placing the nail trap a slight bit better than DK did, by firing a magnet directly where V2 will land later. He does the fight in a very similar way to DK, with the only difference being at the end, where instead of using a projectile boost, he uses a slab shot. 
Then once again saving time, Pot slam jumps to grab the newly spawned arm as opposed to just standing there to collect it. And finally, Pot has regained just enough health over the course of the V2 fight to be able to core eject boost himself one last time into the exit shaft, saving enough time to end with a 24.223, almost four whole seconds clear of DK's time. For the time, this run was very clean. The only fault I really have with it is that Pot uses the Slab Marksman, which is an unforgivable sin to be met with eternal damnation. A few days after that, on the 9th of September, Pot would further improve this time down to a 23.777. This run combines the aforementioned changes to slide velocity, as well as a tech that, during the recent times of demo speedrunning, was hardly used. This tech is one of the most iconic of Ultra Kill, known as Slam Storage. Slam Storage, in short, allows the player to store a slam, hence the name. This is important, as if you jump after a slam, you will get more height the longer you've slammed for. With slam storage, you wall jump while slamming, which resets V1's momentum to that of a wall jump, but keeps V1 in a slamming state. If you jump when you hit the ground, all of this built up speed will send V1 flying into the stratosphere, which in itself is not the most useful thing. However, the change with the early access release that allowed players to retain speed through slide jumps as well as a mechanic that converts time spent falling or slamming into momentum, means a slam storage into a slide jump is a way to instantly hit the maximum speed that slide jumps will let you travel at. This interaction is used relentlessly throughout Ultra Kill speedrunning, as the in-game timer does not start until after the red door opens, leaving players free to build up speed before the timer starts. For POTS 1-4 run, he uses this technique at the starting door, which sends him at a similar speed to a core eject, but puts him in a much better spot for the rest of the level. Another slight save is found at the final hit of V2, where a shotgun was fired at the same time as a knuckle blast punch into V2. This was a small amount faster than the tracking down and shooting with the slab of the previous run. Although a very solid run, it was nowhere near perfect. It held on for the better part of a month, but once all the other levels in this newly released game got a few speedruns on them, this record's time would come to its end. With these last couple of records, a small rivalry had been brewing between DK and Pot, both of them eager to take records. This ended up accumulating on the 28th of September, when DK takes back the world record with a 23.618. In this run, DK opted to move V2 slightly before the fight starts, positioning V2 to theoretically get hit by more nails so that it would take more damage. Additionally, V2 was launched by Rail Cannon in a way that DK was able to finish the kill with V2 being very centered in the arena, even going so far as to stop V2's momentum, leading to a near instant jump in arm spawn. Interestingly, when this was the record, it was done in a P% fashion. This would make things a little interesting later. But as for now, that's not the only thing that was done on September 28th. DK had mentioned to the Discord chat that he had beaten Pot's world record in 1-4, and seemingly sparked an interest among us couple other runners. Expectedly, Pot was interested. Also interested was a new face to the 1-4 scene, Jambot, who set a 23.246, four tenths up on DK's time. A couple time saves in this run came from the some unusual but faster starting movement, including a dash jump from the beginning as well as the final blow on V2 becoming a slam instead of an aim and fire. This ends with V2 dying around the 16.4 second mark as opposed to 16.8. However, with this new run there was a very glaring problem. The arm grab. This arm grab was almost what you could consider a blunder. Jam cleverly made up for it on the exit with a CE boost before he got to the door, saving just a bit of time that he lost. But Jam was very clearly not satisfied there, knowing there is a large blunder that was made at the end. A short time later on the same day, Jam came back with another world record, this time a 22.189, managing to shave off over a second from this time. And it all manages to stem from one extremely clever move, shooting the magnet. A somewhat niche feature of magnets is that they explode as you shoot them, allowing for all that's attached to go flying. In this case, Jam does it as V2 is officially spawning in with a health bar, making more nails hit V2 compared to other runs where V2 is just launched away. Shooting the nail bomb like this deals about 85% of V2's health and damage in this run. This allows for a simple rail coin to end V2, no final shot necessary. 
Jam also made sure not to mess up the arm grab this time, regaining a lot of his lost time from the previous run. This was already an insane stretch of runs that Jam got, but through some miracle, a few hours after this on the same day, Jam got a 20.428. This is almost two whole seconds of time save that all happens in the last room. Jam's V2 kill is very similar to last time you may notice, but has one key difference. He only shoots out one coin. Jam doesn't need the damage from two coins, leading him to forego that entirely. He shoots the rail cannon faster as well. However, it doesn't stop there. He also slam jumps at a better time, and core boosts again to save a total of nearly two seconds in the level. Following this run, Jam mentioned that a sub-20 should be possible, with DK and Pot both interested in pulling off such a feat as well. With these new records set, and Jam had saved three seconds on the world record this short, he decided that was good enough for one day and called it a night. However, DK and Potluck were both up and hunting for the elusive sub-20, setting personal bests and, crucially, trying out some slightly bolder strategies. Potluck ended up being the one setting sub-20, and this run was exceptionally impressive. He had not only broken the sub-20 barrier, but passed 19.5 as well. What made this run a whole second faster than Jam's already amazing run? Well, Pot starts off with an exceptional nail bomb, which, even without the trick of shooting the nail bomb, does immense damage. Additionally, Pot throws a coin even before the fight starts, and effectively perfectly times his rail cannon shot to hit V2 before hitting the coin, leading to V2 getting rail coined and hit twice by a rail cannon. Between these two sources of damage, V2 is down before Conductor can even kick in. Coupled with an exceptionally good V2 launch, leading to an instant V2 jump, Pot is able to get that time that, to this day, is still unmatched using these strategies. However, there was one other time save in this run that would end up being useful in other levels later, the slam storage at the beginning. Instead of using the entrance shaft or the door opening to the level, Pot used the wall before the door to hit the ground sooner after slam storage, allowing him to slide jump sooner after the level timer starts. Remember, the timer starts when the door opens, so being able to slide jump sooner after the door opens means time save. With modern doors, however, you can just slam storage earlier on, so slide wall slam storage is usually relegated to levels where you want the height from the slam storage. This was much faster than the dash jump that Jam did and combining this with the nail bomb and rail coin shenanigans yields a substantial time save. With this momentous sub-20 barrier broken, interest in the category died down a bit since it couldn't reasonably go any lower, right? Well, that's what everyone else seemed to think too, but that would all change very soon. On October 10th, 2020, a community member named Bionic Warrior displayed some findings in the Ultra Kill Discord that would bring V2 to its knees. According to him, a few days prior he was using coin punches to insta-kill bosses, as before P-1, coin punches didn't have a damage cap. By repeatedly punching the coin for a while, Bionic intended to insta-kill all the bosses at the time just by building up damage before the fight. This wasn't necessarily faster than any speedrunning strats, but it was pretty funny. However, when Bionic reached 1-4, the coin punch used to insta-kill V2 accidentally insta-killed V2 before the fight even started. The big discovery here was that, during V2's intro sequence, as soon as you can see V2, you can punch the coin into it, and it will take damage. This is a trait that's unique to V2, and specifically the V2 encounter in 1-4. Some more testing was done, and despite charge shot, ultravolver primary fire, and rail cannon being unable to damage V2, aforementioned coin punches could, as well as ricochets using standard revolver primary fire. While not used now, that will be very important later. But immediately after this discovery, it was theorized that you could chain punches to start the fight with massive damage on V2. This was immediately brought to the attention of all the speedrunners running the level at the time, and they immediately got to work. They messed with it for a while and found it kind of finicky, but soon found the optimal strategy punching the same coin five times. This would actually kill V2 before he even got out of his cutscene, 
This would definitely save time over waiting for V2 to spawn in, even if the kill was nearly instant. This is very obviously shown when Pot says he is getting consistent 19s. He even goes so far as to say that 18 is possible. Pot had clearly put in some work for the rest of that day, and possibly even into the night, because when the next day rolled around, October 11th, 2020, Potluck did actually get his sub-19. Using what had been deemed the fastest way to get into the arena, namely slam storage, Pot takes the marksman revolver, spits out a coin, and punches it into V2. Despite the fact that V2 is in its intro cutscene phase, with repeated punching from Pot, V2 simply ceases to be, dropping its red arm and allowing Pot to finish with a new world record. Remember how Pot said that 18 is theoretically possible? Well this isn't just an 18, it's even more than a 17. Pot achieved a 16.833, well over a second clear of what he initially expected to even be possible. The coin punching strategy was truly an effective exploit of what is very visibly V2's fatal flaw. However, there was something else in this run that was very notable, and if you weren't looking for it, you may not have picked up on it at all. Pot here actually laid the groundwork for what would later on be optimized to a very high degree. In older patches, V2 could be moved, but it was extremely difficult to make him move significantly, despite it being possible. This is no longer the case, but that's not relevant yet. For now, Pot just gives V2 a gentle nudge in the direction of the center where V2 jumps up, saving a little bit of time as V2 now has to do that much less walking. This run is so much better than anyone could have realistically expected it to be. For the time, 1-4 running died down for a bit. There weren't really any improvements that could be made to this, since for the time, this appeared to be the human limit. That would all change a couple short months later, when a different runner set the rise on 1-4. On the 19th of December, 2020, a runner named Debatable sent a screenshot of him getting a 16.965, and soon after, a 16.656, which beat out Potluck's recent time by a decent margin. Deb didn't end up uploading anything, determined to do better, and did just that a short bit later. Debatable actually recorded himself getting a 16.536, an even better time than before. This is the point where runs could start looking a little strange to the untrained eye. If you remember Pot's record prior to this, he had some consistent punches of the coin. However, Debatable felt no need to simply wait around for the coin punches. He practically invented what he called a double punch for V2, where you time the coin punches and jumps in such a way that you can punch the coin twice before hitting the ground. And by doing so, your punches will become capped by arm exhaustion a much more complicated mechanic not as well understood by most until later. It basically adds a secondary cooldown to parrying that prevents you from parrying as often. Given that it's so complicated, I'm not really going to go into it here, but there are other videos out there demonstrating this. Doing these double punches twice, with the fifth punch happening at the start of the fight, downs V2 completely. After this, we also see the slight pushing of V2 return. However, Debatable wasn't done rewriting the rules of the run just yet. He thought of a brand new strategy for this arm drop, explosion boosting into the air. Instead of simply slam jumping, Debatable figured that you could get much more height, and faster, by core ejecting yourself into the air. Additionally, Deb claims that this core eject boost is still the optimal strategy for grabbing the arm, as when timed right, the apex of your jump will be exactly where the arm spawns, making it possible to grab the arm on the first frame of the arm spawning. A run that can top the seemingly unbeatable 16.833 is no joke, and to Pot, it was a challenge. Later that day, Pot returned fire with a 16.3 that, unfortunately, was not fully recorded but it was recorded alongside a 16.440, and almost in a bid to prove that debatable rewriting strats wasn't necessary, he did it all with his old reliable. This time, he modified his version of the coin punching, where he slammed to the ground after a punch so he could punch the coin again sooner, getting closer to the max punching speed in his own way. This took back the world record from debatable, and Pot thought he was safe for a time. It would last for mere hours. Debatable was interested in far lower times, and nearly skipped to sub-16 when he achieved a time of 16.030. The time save in this run came almost entirely from the outside of the boss fight, with some extremely clean slide hops to keep Slam Storage momentum. Not only that, 
This time he boosted into the air sooner to be able to grab the arm that much faster. All in all, something Potluck couldn't readily beat, as both called it a night after three records were set. The day after this, on December 20th, 2020, an update would come out that allows level start doors to open sooner if you are sliding or dash jumping towards them. This is the door change mentioned earlier. It means that you can slam storage from the back wall and still have tons of momentum coming out of the room instead of trying to slam store on the door itself. After this update would come a stretch of runs so unbelievably dominant that it would make sense why the Act 4 of this video is called Indomitable. It starts a little over a week after this, on December 31st, 2020, around when Pop posts a video demonstrating a new rollout for the updated doors on 1.4. About this time, Travis was also running 1.4, gaining on Pot and Deb with a few 17s and soon after a 16.863. Soon after this, Deb asked what spawn times the newer starting movement was getting, having stopped running 1-4 after the door change, mistakenly believing the door change would lose too much time. After Travis showed getting a 5.2 second V2 spawn with a dash jump strategy, 0.4 seconds faster than what Deb was able to get after the door change using old strategies, the two rapidly began chipping away at their times. Travis was the first to break sub-16 with a 15.855, using his newfound dash jump opening and with some fast punches, but no core eject boost to grab the arm, losing a little bit of time there. Less than a half hour later, Deb joined the sub-16 club with a 15.936, just to beat it in 5 minutes with a 15.678, reclaiming the 1-4 record. This run uses everything known up to this point, the dash jump to start, Mal rail to boost the window, double coin punches, moving V2, and the double CE boost to end the level. Not much longer after that, Deb gets a 15.497, having seen people noticing again that standard ricochets hurt V2, and being unsure what the optimal kill was. However, nothing was to come of this just yet. As for the 15.497, the one big time save is going for a harder first coin punch opting to punch the coin as V2 hits the ground instead of waiting for the shockwave to launch him toward a coin he throws, meaning the koi punch chain can be started sooner. Additionally, in this run, Debatable actually exploded himself into the air before V2 even jumped. It wasn't perfect as you can see the arm spawn, but for now it's enough of a time save. Deb changes his mind about waiting and runs a bit more the next day getting a 15.379 without a video, and a 15.236 later, showcasing a 5.1 V2 spawn, and what Deb referred to as a first frame arm grab. If you look closely, despite hearing the sound effect for the arm being picked up, the arm doesn't swap, and no animation plays. Come the new year, on January 1st, Deb lowered his time again with a 15.198, a similar run to the rest, but an improvement nonetheless. Some smaller things happened here too, such as BGB suggesting to shoot out the window with a revolver, and some experimentation with bouncing V2 off of V1's hitbox to try to land V2 in the center of the arena, but nothing like that was ever seen in a run. Around 7 hours later, Deb finally gets his sub-15 with a time of 14.967. Most of the time saved was just faster movement at the start, but a slightly faster start and cleaner finish ended up being just enough to break the 15 second barrier. The next day, Deb shared a 14.856, and soon after a 14.848. Despite claiming 14.6 to be the goal, the flurry of records being set started to slow, and Deb was seemingly running out of ways to save any notable amounts of time. That is, until the idea of Ultra Boosting came into play. After some experimentation and learning how to Ultra Boost, including coming up with a way to mid-air Ultra Boost inspired by a video from Cabal Crow, by the end of the month, Deb set about finding a way to fit an Ultra Boost into 1-4, no matter how little time it might save. And soon enough, he proved the window Ultra Boost to be possible, and not much longer after that video, posted a screenshot of a 14.991. Two days later, Deb uploaded a 14.890 using the Ultra Boost entry. Despite being a noticeably faster spawn, a clean fight, and the first frame arm grab, slow CE boost there through the end doors lost almost a third of a second, enough time to deny Deb his 14.6. That did not mean he would stop there, but using these strategies yielded nothing. However, Deb had been working on something else in the meantime. 
He had rerouted 1-4P% to use not just coin punches, but also those standard ricochets mentioned earlier, back when the category was proven to be able to go below 19 and potentially further, right before Jam caught up and optimized it to a 16.665. Nothing that could compete with any percent, at least not until a reroute occurred by the runner Yellow Swerve. On March 3rd, Swerve mentioned he was interested in learning the coin strategy, so that he could integrate it into his full game runs. However, what ended up happening was a new approach to 1-4p%, which involved punching the coin four times, shooting it, and then shooting two more coins. By changing around the order of the ricochets so that both happen before V2 hits the ground, four punches in a ricochet is faster than five total punches, bringing this new P% percent strat into the foreground as the new fastest way to kill V2, allowing the new theoretical best to be now 14.2, or possibly even lower. On March 5th, 2021, Deb finally got his 14.6. Something important here is that there is very definitely room for a time save on this run. Deb didn't ultra boost to the final room, he just went back to the Malrail strats. Meaning there is still that theoretical couple tens of time save. Deb ended up setting a time of 14.626, and Deb achieved a P rank on this level. I mentioned this earlier when DK got a P rank, but this is actually the main reason this world record history can be very confusing because for a time, the fastest clear of a level was held by P% percent runs. A few days later, on March 8th, 2021, after he was more comfortable with the V2 kill, Deb came back to use his Ultra Boost strategy into the fight, yielding the first ever 4.6 Swan and a couple new records. Later that day, however, Deb posted a 14.310, slowly getting closer and closer to a sub-14. Some scuffed starting movement lost a little bit of time, but as everything else had minimal error, the run yielded yet another record. Considering V2 spawned at 4.9, and a high 4.6 was known to be possible, Sub-14 was in sight as always, feeling within reach. A short time later, Deb got a 1-4 Ultra Boost example from another prominent 1-4 runner, who was one of the first people to get Sub-15, Rowan. In the notes of their run, Rowan felt confident enough in the rest of the run to say that the only time save left is the Ultra Boost. With this Ultra Boost example given to him, Deb ended up getting his lowest 4.6 spawn yet, and ran the level for some time, leading to a run with a 4.7 spawn, 0.2 seconds ahead of the 14.310, and coincidentally, the run ended up being 14.122, almost exactly 0.2 seconds faster. Deb noted that after this, if he were to ricochet faster, and he were to punch the coin the frame V2 hit the ground, he would save 0.15 seconds, enough for a sub-14. Additionally, V2 wasn't moved very far, which meant there was potentially a little more time to be saved there too. At this point, although knowing sub-14 was possible, it was agreed that it would take an absolutely insane run to pull this off. Additionally, two days later, the Soul Survivor update released, which contains the levels P-1 and 2-S. It also contained a number of other changes, which took just about everyone's attention for a good while. So for a time, the world record didn't change. One important detail first noticed by Rowan was the V2 no longer was extremely hard to push around. In fact, V2 was almost too easy to move, now being completely unaffected by any sort of friction. This is one of the big, albeit unintentional, changes to the level that came from an update. However, being able to move V2 this much was not optimized for a while. Another find involved what can be considered a precursor to dead coining, but nothing would come of that until even later. Three months after that earlier 14.122, well after Greed had released, Debatable finally got his sub-14 with a time of 13.878. A number of things came together to make this run possible. First was the changes to Ultra Boosts. With the release of Greed, you are only able to be hit by one explosion at a time, which would have removed Ultra Boosts, but Hakita made shooting a core eject with a Malrail a special explosion, not only buffing it in damage and range, but making it an intended mechanic, effectively giving you the same speed boost as before. Next, Debatable, for the first time seen in record history, would go to push V2 and successfully push the red robot completely to the center square. Utilizing the earlier changes to V2 being so slippery, 
He found that you can get in front of V2 in order to stop it. To get to the other side, Deb found that dashing through V2 meant that you wouldn't collide, allowing you to move freely through it without impacting the direction. By dashing to the center of the arena after pushing V2 in that direction, Debatable stops V2, allowing it to jump up immediately instead of it having to walk at all, unlike earlier runs where moving V2 this far was effectively impossible. In any case, this successful push would shave a relatively huge chunk of time from the already nearly perfectly optimized record. So despite the Ultra Boost entry not being as fast as the one in 14.122, being able to get the fight so consistently results in a 13.878, comfortably below the threshold for sub-14. Some other fun details include that this run had a legendary triple punch that was unseen until now due to being inexplicably inconsistent, only seen in one previous run by Jambot. Additionally, Debatable said that a 13.6 was likely possible, albeit it would all be in a time save from the movement at the start, since the V2 spawn in this run was only a 4.8. As mentioned before, this push of V2 in the world record would become a main staple of tech for any future world record runs, as it saves almost a full half second over not moving V2 at all, which for a level like 1.4 is extremely significant to say the least. With sub-14 finally being reached, it didn't make much sense to continue trying to grind down the category, since it couldn't reasonably go lower, right? Well, the previous few records Debatable has done were all P% percent runs, beating out even the Any% percent category. I've mentioned this a few times, but the reason being that this was the fastest known V2 kill, and it just happened to result in a P rank. But the Any% percent runners, who hadn't really played a part up to now, were about to shock everyone. For the past 10 months, Debatable had been entirely indomitable in the 1-4 scene. His world record was leagues ahead of everyone else, and whenever someone got even remotely close to his time, he would lower it again, making it that much more difficult to remove him from his reign. However, a little over a month after Debatable's historic sub-14, another runner would start doing 1-4 attempts. This runner's name is Little Piggy, also referred to as Glory. On August 21st, 2021, Piggy would begin a saga of 1-4 attempts, despite the fact that he didn't even really know the routing. After a day's worth of attempts, he would achieve a sub-17 and then even a sub-16, albeit barely with a 15.999. Piggy was over two seconds off of even matching the world record. After a little friendly advice from Debatable, as well as a good night's rest, Piggy achieved a 15.393 absolutely destroying his previous time. However, it's worth noting that even though this is 1.5 seconds slower than the world record, it was a very unique route. Piggy had been experimenting with using Rail Cannon in the fight with V2 to only need to punch the coins three times, as opposed to four. A non-standardized route, and it would be the first of its kind to reach sub-15, as Deb pointed out. There was a very unique quirk in this run, however. With the way that Piggy shot the coins, he ended up accidentally doing what is called a dead coin using the rail cannon. This was extremely hard to replicate at this time though, and would require a bit of practice to actually execute in a run. A few days later, on the 26th of August, Piggy would post a slightly lower time, messing up the exit door, losing a fair amount of time, and also quite possibly costing him that sub-15. Later that day, we see a rectification of his skill issue absolutely annihilating the sub-15 barrier with a 14.6, which also gave him the push to implement the new strategy in the V2 fight, where you would be able to theoretically skip the punch entirely at the cost of not being able to UB into the boss arena. This actually ended up being most of what gave cause to one of the most broken techs in Ultra Kill as we know it, dead coining. There is a little bit of technicality around it. The gist of how it works is that it utilizes the short window after the coin is initially spit out. In this dead period, you can use coin punches and fake ricochets to stack up power on the coin, allowing the bosses to be one-shot. There is a lot of technical detail that you can go into with this tech, but that could be its own several hour long video. Five days after this, on August 31st, Piggy would end up implementing this strategy into a very clean run, as his unique run didn't just give him a PB, it even took down Debatable's run. Piggy set a 13.762 despite not even using a standardized route. In Piggy's run, we see him use the Whiplash to break glass instead of shooting it, which at this point will become standard practice later. With the aforementioned modified V2 fight to include a rail coin in midair, Piggy sets the world record by a little more than a tenth of a second. 
Something worth noting is that there were two noticeable slowdowns in this run. The coin punching slowdown occurs when Piggy fails to jump for the final punch of the coin, the other slowdown occurs when Piggy somewhat lets V2 overshoot on the slide. Considering both of these things, reasonably we should expect better times in the future, which is exactly what Piggy did. After the last run, Piggy had a realization that he had been punching the first coin for seemingly no reason, and that he could save time by just shooting it. Deb agreed with this time save, stating that starting with an arm exhaustion cooldown of zero would allow the triple punch to be basically free, as you would only need exactly three punches. Two weeks later, on the 4th of September 2021, Piggy goes on another tear. He gets a 13.666 that was lost due to a recording malfunction, a 13.583, and then, for the last run of the day, he rectified the coin punching error he had made in the previous run, setting a 13.495, breaking through the 13.5 barrier. Piggy calls it a day here, but vows to get that sub-13 eventually. Debatable returns to the category a few weeks later, on the 29th of September, setting a 13.179. Deb uses the hallway UB, something Piggy hasn't been doing, yielding about 0.3 seconds of time save comparatively. With this run being set, Deb did a little math, and determined that sub-13 is theoretically possible. It would take a nearly perfect run, but it would be doable. A few days after this, Piggy made it very clear he was not settling for second. He wanted to push for the sub-13. In one run, he copied debatable strats nearly exactly, and ended up with a new world record of 13.158. After this, he would call it a day and end up not returning to the category for some time, and neither would Debatable, or anyone else for that matter. For three whole months, this 13.158 held as the world record, until someone's interest in 1-4 was reawakened. Not only that, but he managed to discover a slight optimization when it came to coin punching. Jambot returned to the category, and got a sub-13 time at long last, setting down a 12.878. What was the optimization here? It's very difficult to see, but when Jam is falling down to start punching coins, not only does he punch the coin down initially, but he then punches it again while he's still falling. This would naturally save a good amount of time since you're not simply waiting for the coin. This was the same logic used for jumping to punch the coin, only it's done yet again with a different part of the run. Two days after this, on the 6th of January, Piggy made it clear yet again that he wanted to be on top of 1-4 speedrunning. It was getting increasingly difficult to find time saves. So Piggy threw out the question to the Discord. Travis pointed out that Piggy wasn't ultra-boosting very quickly compared to Debatable. Five minutes after this suggestion, Piggy not only gets a 12.75 any percent run, beating out jams by over a tenth of a second, but also sets the first sub-13 second P% percent run with a 12.986. The tenth saved on jam is mainly due to a slight optimization with the sliding, and also may have had something to do with the choice to overpump boost out of the level as opposed to core eject boosting. Finally, Piggy seemed to be the one on top, and now that Debatable hadn't been seen on the scene for a few months, it seemed like this 12.75 would last a while. Three hours after Piggy's video was uploaded, there's another run uploaded to YouTube. It was a P% run from Debatable. Using every last ounce of skill, Debatable managed to beat Piggy's 12.986 P% run, However, this run also managed to beat the 12.75, because Debatable came at it with a 12.748. Two milliseconds faster. Debatable submitted this run with an interesting attached comment. One day, in some way, there will be an 11. However, this was Debatable's last run in 1-4. Not only that, Piggy would also never again touch 1-4. So whoever was going to lower the record again would have to be someone other than these two. A saving grace for the category came about a month after this, when Jambot came back on the 15th of February to set a 12.577, inching closer to the sub-11 Deb spoke about. Jam did his trademarked fast coin punch on the fall downwards, which saved just enough time to get almost two-tenths of time save. Finally! As well. <laughs> but that seemed like that was it. This, for yet another time in the history of 1-4, looked unbeatable. What further improvements even were there to be made? Everyone was thinking that there was a faster kill or perhaps a slightly faster boss room entrance. No one even thought to look at the beginning of the level, 
since slam store slide jumping was known to be one of the fastest ways to move around. But what if there was a movement method that everyone had overlooked? Three months after this, a runner by the name of XVYZ set a 17.231. Now, although this run is pretty good, it's nowhere near the world record. So why was this run specifically so crucial to the progression of 1-4? It was all thanks to the very different movement happening at the beginning. This is called diving. It is very similar to slide jumping, especially when it comes to the inputs to perform it. However, it is faster, if even only by a little bit. Here in 1-4, it's the best available movement option given its speed. It's a pretty fast way to get around in general, sure, but it's slower than something like an explosion boost. But this was perfect. It was almost the perfect speed to maximize efficiency in 1-4. Fast enough to get to the door in good time, slow enough to not get completely blocked by the door. Not only that, but momentum with dives is a bit weird, as well as the hitbox. Notice here how XVYZ seemingly never stops at the first door, a big contrast to what we have been seeing, which is stopping at the door even if briefly as you can't quite go through it yet. However, this does beg the question why the speedrunners missed this. Well, simply put, dives were not a viable strategy up to this point. In the current Ultra Kill patch as of this video, some players may know that moving at a high speed and then sliding will eventually reduce your slide speed to whatever the standard sliding speed is. However, prior to a random update that changed this for whatever reason, this also applied to when you were quote-unquote sliding in the air. This was only useful in a few levels because of this, as you would be moving slowly, but through the air at a somewhat diagonal angle. This run, although not a world record, would prove that faster times were, in fact, possible, and with the proof of a faster strat to get through the beginning, this would spawn a 1-4 renaissance. Six days after this discovery, on May 19th, an established runner named Robot Dreisler would use this new diving technique in a P-Percent run, using all available knowledge of this level to set a 12.497, the first ever sub 12 and a half. This firmly implanted in everyone's minds that diving was the way to go, as Dreisler barely even got stopped by the cursed doors of 1-4. Not even a day later on May 20th, Jambot would come back yet again, immediately taking Dreisler's spot with a 12.367. Time save here was mainly due to a slightly modified coin strategy, as it was becoming more common to just slam when the slowdown of V2's entrance occurred as opposed to nearly overshooting. Also, the coin punching had another slight optimization, when slamming and rejumping to punch proved to be slightly faster. Sub-12 was looking more and more likely every day. Three days after Jam had taken the record back, another established runner would try their hand at the category, Hayes. Hayes is said to be one of the best players of the game, and they made that very well known with this run, a 12.119. This run features some brilliant multitasking with the UB in the hallway, as well as the fastest coin punching scene yet. Not only that, the V2 push was nearing perfect. Four days after Hayes beat Jam, Jam would come back at Hayes, saving just a bit of time on the slight modification to diving, where Jam lets off the dive right before the door, slowing down ever so slightly so as to not bong on the door as much. He nears perfection for the entire run and does the fastest available strats, and ends the level with a time of 12.023. This is indescribably painful to see, as the run was just so damn close to the sub-12 that was theorized a few months prior. I think that Jam's voice clip from the end of the run sums up how about everyone felt on seeing this. God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Fortunately for everyone, and especially if you've been a speedrunner or in a speedrunning community, this feeling of dread is actually a beacon of hope. Jam's run wasn't pixel perfect, meaning there was definitely room to save a few frames to get that sub-12, which is exactly what a certain duck would attempt. Three days after the heartbreaking 12.0, on May 30th, Quack Quack would try their hand at the category, and modify one thing ever so slightly to make a difference. Instead of breaking the window and then ultra boosting, Quack opted to ultra boost and then used the very small window of time flying through the air to break the window. This is extremely difficult to pull off, but it was well worth it. The end time of this run was 11.972, a sub 12 at long last. After nearly three weeks of 1-4 fever taking over the entire community, it was a streak of amazing runners setting amazing times 
finally breaking a barrier that had been talked about for months. But this new time on the boards put a slight stop to runs for about a month. That's when a known runner and 1-4 prodigy decided to get his hands on the record, Hodgepodge. And he was well known for running 1-4, especially 1-4 Nomo, which is the category where you move through the level as fast as possible with enemy spawns disabled. After a world record time in this category without the V2 fight, he proceeded to gap everyone else and lay claim to a slew of new records, lowering the Nomo world record by over half a second. After lowering it sufficiently, he decides to use his experience with having the fastest movement in 1-4 to his advantage, starting to grind away at the categories that actually fight V2. Given how good he was without V2, it's natural that he would start setting amazing times right away, since all he needed to learn was the V2 kill. Within a few days, he was catching up to the bigger name runners. He sets a 12.987 in the P% percent category. Quite an achievement even by today's standards. In the early morning of June 29th, he came extremely close to Quek's record, only 2 milliseconds slower. Then about a half hour later, he would finally do it. With slightly faster dives than Quek did in the last record, Hodge managed to either tie or ever so slightly improve almost everything else. Almost everything else. The push section was still under development. In this run, Hodge got a very nice push, but V2 didn't stop quite at the spot you would normally want it to. This not only lost a bit of time from the extra distance, but also from the ever so slightly delayed arm grab because of this. This ends with a time of 11.921, merely 0.051 seconds faster than Quek. This stood for a couple months, since no one was really insane enough to try to beat this. Couple that with the fact the record couldn't realistically go much lower than this anyway. Not only those problems, but most runners that interacted with the entirety of the Limbo layer were met with a problem that all 1-4 runners knew a little too well. The doors. Limbo doors were known for being very slow to open, and you can see in all of the 1-4 routing up to this point how runners tried to work around the doors being slow. This really closed off a lot of room for improvement. All of that would soon change, however. On August 16th, a new update would release for the game, the long-awaited Wrath and Heresy update. This took a lot of resources from the community, as there are many new levels to be optimized, but getting new levels shouldn't affect older ones. This update, however, did affect 1-4 speedrunning, believe it or not, thanks to one somewhat obscure line in the update notes that a few runners noticed and then immediately started taking advantage of. Limbo doors now open faster if the player is moving at high speeds. This would mean that you wouldn't have to route around slow doors. You could now throw yourself at them without ever slowing down. The day after this, Jam returns to the category and sets an 11.902, another 19 milliseconds of time save, coming entirely from slam store slide jumping, which is faster than diving. Diving was the best available movement option for the time, setting you at the perfect speed for slow open doors. However, with that no longer being a problem, slam store slide jumping would return, and better than ever. This run is what re-sparked an interest in 1-4 for the entire community, who would then proceed to use some strats that shouldn't be humanly possible. On August 18th, 2022, a new theory was crafted by Hayes, a previous record holder, and Colin, another very strong runner. This spawned from another runner who had been chasing the 1-4 record for a long time now, Nutty Bijaz, commonly referred to as Nutty. Colin suggested that you could theoretically use the Ultra Boost tech, the one that's used to get through the window, to be able to move through the level at extremely high speeds via B-hopping, since it had been established that the doors would open in time for you now. There was just one more problem with this. Ultra Boosting at the beginning would mean using your rail early, and you wouldn't have it for going through the window into the arena. To solve this, Jambot suggested using the checkpoint to recharge the rail cannon, so that a double UB would be possible. There is a small but very significant tech around checkpoints, where you're able to keep your momentum. Travis's description is that you keep all momentum that you had when resetting to a checkpoint for a brief moment after you actually checkpoint. If you jump immediately after, you will go up with that amount of momentum. However, in this level, we're looking at the horizontal applications. In this case, that would involve a slide jump mere frames after resetting to the checkpoint, which would, as far as the timer is concerned, give you a free rail with hardly any time loss. 
Using the slight exploit of checkpoint mechanics, Nutty managed to get a run later that day, and for Nutty, at long last, after 9 whole months of grinding the category and falling just short of the bigger runners, got his time in the spotlight, setting an 11.848 with this revolutionary new WB technique. This is the start of what we could consider the first modern 1-4 speedrun. From here on, pretty much every run will need to feature this. Well, any percent run. Because of using the checkpoint for another rail shot, P% percent can no longer keep up with any percent, since P% percent is not allowed to checkpoint and keep the P rank. This means that JM's 11.902 would be the last P% percent run top the any percent boards. A day after this run was set, Nutty decided to continue practicing, seeing how far down he could get this. On August 19th, he got an 11.822, time saved simply off of checkpointing slightly faster compared to the last run. However, Hodge caught wind of Nutty trying to steal the record, and for what is yet another time in 1-4 history, another rivalry broke out. Hodge would come back swinging, setting a monster time. A nearly frame-perfect checkpoint, combined with a slightly cleaner V2 kill and a slightly better push, knocked this time down over a quarter of a second, ending with an 11.521. But Nutty, he wasn't done just yet. It would take a few days, but on the 25th of August, Nutty would prove himself to Hodge and the greater 1-4 community yet again. Using a slightly modified starting room strategy to be able to get the necessary speed quicker, as well as a slightly modified exit room strategy to be able to leave the slightest bit faster, Nutty sets the first sub-11.5 with 11.41. However, given that this run took 5 days to get over Hodge's 11.521, Hodge was also around and practicing, wanting that sub 11.5 nearly as bad. Later on the same day, he too would set a time to beat, with an actually frame-perfect checkpoint, as well as the slightest improvement on the V2 kill, where you can punch while coming back down from the height as opposed to slam jumping, a technique that was used by Jam a few months back. Hodge set an 11.378, barely beating out Nutty's time. This would actually end the rivalry. Both have stated that they enjoyed bantering the times down, but at this point Nutty needed a break from 1-4, swearing that he'll be back one day. However, Hodge decided that he wasn't quite done with this level, and he wanted all the records, on every category in 1-4. He had set a P% percent record a few days before this, and 11.847 on the 23rd. He also set no mo record on the 20th, with a 5.75. This gave Hodge a triple crown in 1-4 speedrunning, a clean sweep where he held every world record. However, even though we're not considering Nomo as part of this world record history, it's very crucial to it that Hodge wanted his Nomo time to go lower here. On August 30th, Hodge beat this Nomo with a time of 5.379, where he noticed that something was a bit off with the starting ultra boost. He got sent a bit further than he normally does, and he came very close to not needing a second B-hop. Hodge thought to dig deeper, and he actually managed to get the checkpoint in simply one B-hop. He notified the greater speedrunning community, but didn't think too much of it, since it could have just been a pixel-perfect lineup that would be nearly impossible to recreate. Fast forward a few days to September 3rd. An unsuspecting runner by the name of Marcy manages to get a 1.884 checkpoint. Unfortunately, this run suffered from a failed coin punch and never made it past V2. But Marcy proved that this God UB, as it had been deemed, was perfectly viable. Upon seeing this, Hodge decided to try his hand again, now having two different reference videos to figure out how to line up this UB properly. Between Hodge, Nutty, Marcy, and a few hours of testing, they finally cracked the code for how to do the God UB. We luckily have a picture of Hodge's brain to help us examine how this is different and how it functions. What's happening is that the God UB setup hits this flat part of the doorway, exiting the spawn room. Prior to this, any Ultra Boost attempt would hit this downward slope, killing off some momentum immediately, making it necessary for a double B-hop, which proceeds to lose more time by having to stand on the ground an extra time. However, hitting this exact spot on the door requires a very specific lineup, something that took a few dedicated hours to solving. Later that same day on this fateful September 3rd, Hodge would use this new knowledge to use God UB in a run. Getting a 1.774 checkpoint, Hodge then proceeds to do everything else slower than his last record. The biggest time loss here is the fact that V2 kept sliding. Despite nearly half a second of time save in the early stage thanks to the God UB, Hodge ended up with an 11.359, only a few frames faster than his previous run. Late into the night on September 3rd, Hodge was continuing to run 1-4 since there was so much possible time save, so much being a relative term here. 
Ultra boosting out of the starting area, Hodge got a 1.673 checkpoint, even faster than anyone even considered possible at the time. But there is a slight error in the V2 push. V2 went too far again. Hodge did a lot right, and he did one thing beyond perfectly. This would be a world record, no doubt about it. But Hodge's heart still sank, seeing the ending time was an 11. An 11.061. This was absolutely devastating to Hodge. The thumbnail of the video describes it all, honestly. But Hodge knew that this was only the first day of God you'd be being discovered. There would be more to improve on this later. That sub-11, as tedious as it would be to get, would be his. And then, in the early hours of the morning on September 5th, Hodge got this run. a 10.758. Not only did Hodge manage to get sub-11, he absolutely obliterated it. With his fastest checkpoint yet and near-perfect movement throughout the level, people have likened this run to a Taz, since it's just so hard to believe this was done by a human. But it's not like Hodge didn't have to earn it. At well over 100 hours into 1-4 alone at this point, and quite possibly many more, Hodge had made something wonderful. Around this time, a few other runners were caught up in the 1-4 fever. Of the people running, the biggest threat to the record ended up being Jazz Hands, when she achieved the second ever sub-11 second time. The next day, she got within spitting distance of the record, with a 10.768, and then a few days later, she was met with the heartbreak of a 10.759, a single millisecond off of Hodge's record. But she didn't let this discourage her. Immediately back on the grind, two days later, on October 19th, 2022, I woke up to a ping from Jazz, who had finally gotten the run that was needed. A James Bond world record, 0 .007 faster, with a 10.751. This stood for a couple months, especially since no one wanted to deal with such an optimized level anymore. However, on December 7th, word started to spread around the speedruns chat that I was almost done with this very video. This is when six runners decided to form the Anti-Nova Coalition, trying their hardest to delay this video. One forerunners, such as Nutty, Behead, and Len, make a return. Other strong runners show up as well, such as Sink and Colin. Colin being the one that found a better Gaju B lineup, which made it a bit more consistent. Even Debatable returned over a year later, in an attempt to mildly inconvenience me. Using Colin's better lineup, around noon on December 9th, as I was actually editing the credits to this video, I got several pings. Of the six people going at it, Sink was the one who had done it. Using this new, better lineup, Sink had gotten a 10.704. However, although this run is the world record by, at this point, what is a sizable margin, it actually has a very noticeable mistake in it. At the very end, Sink messes up the push of V2, and it angles a little bit too much to the side. This cost a decent chunk of time, as the time almost certainly would have been a mid 10.6 had this error not occurred. In the background, though, another member of this coalition, someone who had proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were exceptionally good at 1-4, and someone who has grinded this level for an estimated 350 hours, thought that it was about time that they took the record. Behead came through with another world record, the one that stands as the all-time fastest ever clear of 1-4, truly epitomizing Act 7 of this video. Insanity. <laughs> 